I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. My mum didn't want me to play because she was worried I would hurt other kids. Jesse Williams, a.k.a. The Monster. I knew I had to outwork every single person. I was happy to die out there. My agent called me. He was like, San Diego Chargers is going to take you. The Washington number comes up. He said, we're going to take you right now. I'm like, is this the Chargers? And they're like, nah, it's the Seahawks. I was like, what the hell's going on? Touchdown, Seahawks! Your Seahawks, Super Bowl 48 champion. First year was my knee. Second year was the other knee. And then my third year, kidney cancer. And he said, this type of cancer is just bad luck. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? What do you want to achieve? The youth is really important to me because that was me. That changed my life exponentially. Jesse Williams, AKA the Monster. How you going, mate? Good, man. Appreciate it. Look at the size of you. My <laughs> God. Yeah, I'm testing out the weight limit of these chairs, that's my for God. sure. I'm hoping it's uh, What are you weighing in at? Right now, I'm probably like 160 kilos. How old are you now? 32. Okay, go back to, you know, eight years, nine years, whatever it is. Uh, what were you weighing in then? I played the NFL around 150, 155. In college, maybe 10, 15 pounds less, but yeah. still roughly all uh, big. 155 kilos. Kilos. Let's just wind back a little bit to when uh, you were up in Queensland and uh, you were playing footy up there, uh, say 80, 90. What, what were you, how big were you then? <laughs> to be seriously honest, probably. Close. I was probably like 135, 140. Oh, even then? Even then. So you've always been a big lad. A big yeah, fella. I think really it was like late teens. I, for my 16th birthday, I asked my parents to give me a gym membership. And then from there, is sky's the limit. You know, it was just lifting weights and getting big. Is that genetic? I mean, like, I don't know if that's just lifting weights. I could do, I could lift weights all the rest of my life. <laughs> I'd never get like that. It's a lot of eating too, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I don't think it's genetic. Both my parents are quite small. Uh, my brother's pretty big, about almost the same height. He's probably – he's cut down a bit now. He's probably about 110 kilos, but um, the frame is there. Yeah, can I just ask you – I love that ring. My God. That's the Super Bowl from 2013, um, the year before the Super Bowl we lost to the Patriots. Um, I think for me, this – it kind of signif- – for me wearing it, even showing people, it just – for me, it, it shows great range. For me, it was the range of being a 14-year-old kid, like shy, chubby, self-doubting kid in the south side of Brisbane with no anything to, to, to what the epitome of standing on a stage at that level um, and then, then the, the transgressions of in between those two points is, uh, is that that's what that means to me. Chubby 14-year-old kid, there's lots of them. Um, what does that mean like, you know, for you when you think back of that kid? Yeah, I think for me was, you know, being a young indigenous kid from the south side of Brisbane, you know, two loving parents, a younger brother, um, sport was my life. It was everything. And um, I didn't really have a great path set out for me. Um, even, you know, still to this day, there's a lot of systemic stuff that really probably isn't um, great for the community, indigenous and non-indigenous. And I think I sort of fell into the trap of playing sports and just doing what every other Aussie kid did. And that was just play sports for the weekend, go to school and keep doing that. I never really had hopes or ambitions around that. Um, And for me, it was like, man, you're battling everything. High school, getting bullied, getting in fights, playing sports, trying to live a normal life. And I think for me, um, having that indigenous side as well uh, and a cultural upbringing um, was really important to keep me sort of grounded in who I was. But it it was still a a pretty tough 14-year-old life. Um, I was just blessed to have a good family around me. to keep me locked in, um, at least push me to the things I wanted to do. Yeah, because I mean, you obviously, in terms of sport anyway, Super Bowl has a pretty big, there's a big distance between that as the kid in South Brizzy, you know, to end up in that territory. Mm-hmm. You know, that's you know, the biggest game in the world, probably billions of people to watch it all around the world. I know everyone in my office is watching when it's on mm-hmm. and down the pub downstairs too, by the way. Absolutely. They're, they're, they're not doing it in the office. Um, did you understand the significance of what you were doing at the time? I don't think at all, at all. It never crossed my mind. I never slowed down enough to think about stuff like that. Um, for myself, watching the Super Bowl was pretty much like, you know, I'd beg my parents to let me get the day off because it would be at like 9 or 10 o'clock in Australia. 
And I remember doing that a lot. Um, and then obviously going through the ranks, playing here and everything. It never was a focal point for me. I never wanted to, I never, I never needed a crutch. I never needed a leverage point. I wanted to fit in with everything. I never needed to be treated different because I was from somewhere different, especially in the US. I wanted to show them that football is first. I'm from Australia, sure, but I can still I can still hit people with some force as well. Do they have a view on Australians? When 100%. You, when you yeah, arrive yeah. there, what's the view? It's different. Like in the US, it, it differs from state to state, right? Each, each state's like a different country. Like when I first got there, I went to a junior college in Arizona and um, – it, it, the junior college is like a melting pot of like some troubled kids that are trying to get out and make a difference. And um, it's a very interesting outlook in Australia. Most people don't think that a, there was no like dark people. They, every Australian person was like some, like look like Chris Hemsworth was surfing <laughs> and like, you know, just Blue eyes blonde, yeah, yeah. surfed and that was it. And they saw me come over, you know, tattooed, you know, playing football pretty good, like still with a pretty, you know, janky accent and whatnot. They were just like, they thought New Zealand straight away or they were like some other they place. Yeah, they that. were like, what like what sort of Australian is that? Um, but then in the South, like I was talking to deal with some people that never left the state of Alabama. So let alone see anything close to Australia. Um, so a lot of it is pretty interesting. Like how far was the drive from Australia? Like what, you know, what what sort of, you know, what sort of government do you have now? And there all this crazy stuff. But the perception is really weird. I think it's, it's a lot better now, but it's still... People just think there's like huge snakes and spiders and like it, as soon as you jump off the plane, like you're on, you know, it's red alert. You know, you might die trying to get to the hotel or something. It's funny. I once uh, used to go with an Irish girl and um, when she first came to Australia, she woke up in the morning and there was kookaburras, you know, how they made that noise. She thought they were monkeys. She thought there was a zoo <laughs> close by. They, you know, that they, they, they laughter they have, it sounds like monkeys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, th she thought there was a zoo nearby. <laughs> I said, no, that's kookaburras. You're like, what the yeah. hell? And uh, it's funny the perception people have about us uh, or about our country, probably more important, but equally us culturally. And Australia's quite diverse when it comes to culture. How does someone like you, Jesse, um, establish yourself as a, a different person in an American football environment? Because they all, all are pretty much the same. It doesn't matter, you know, whether they're black or white or they might be Latino. They're pretty much culturally very similar in mm. football I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. You're different. Yeah, for me, I think like setting my standard, it, it just started day one for me, getting over there. And I had to leave, like coming from here, like there was no one really before me, not in this era of like going to college or doing any of this sort of stuff. So it was like everything was unknown. So I had to be pretty open and be ready for essentially anything. So for myself, that's what it was. As soon as I left, I told my parents, like, I don't want to come back. I only had, I didn't go over on scholarship. Like, I had to work three jobs to, to, to make oh, it. Oh, really? Up. Yeah. So, I didn't go straight to Alabama. I went to a junior college. What's a junior college, by the way? So it's like a level down, kind of like a – it's a smaller school. So usually a junior college, you go there to get your – an AA degree, which allows you to go to – like an undergraduate allows you to go to um, a bigger school. So that school actually came over to Australia looking for punters, saw me. Um, I played well enough in front of them, got MVP at the time we were playing for Australia. And um, he said, man, you, you probably – could go play in the US. At this time, I'm like, I'm taking it with a grain of salt, man. Like, you just know that I'm big and tough and that's that's probably what I want to hear. So I end up sitting down with my parents. I'm like, oh, let's put some effort into trying doing this. Um, you sat with your mom and dad? Yeah, yeah. After I got back from the tournament, like, I won MVP. Like, I was clearly, like, the best player in the country. We played against New Zealand. And um, it was, like, slowly becoming apparent that, like, okay, maybe I'm – Maybe I'm pretty good at this. Maybe this does have a bit of a future in it. So then I'm, this junior college says, yeah, you can come over and we'll save you a spot. Can't give you a scholarship or any money, but, you know, there's a spot here. So then I had to figure out it was about $9,000 um, and I worked three jobs and obviously my parents support, managed to make that happen. So then I left the country at the age of 17, 18 um, with like $200, one bag, and then flew out to Arizona. That's mad. Like uh, for uh, like for anybody, like doesn't matter whether you come from South Brisbane, Brisbane or East suburbs of Sydney. Just especially if you don't have enough much money in your kit bag, mm. you turn up and you start working. What do you do? What you start working there? Like and you're at college. Like that's a big deal. For yeah, start, junior college. You start playing. Then you go and play football for them. Um, but like, how did you like when you got off the plane? 
you obviously knew you were going to live. Did you live at the college premises? Yeah. Yeah. So you turn up there, you don't know where the lunch joint is, you don't know what, you probably weren't even drinking coffee in those days. You, <laughs> you're probably not, you're not old enough to drink over there. No. Um, you're not old enough to drive. Uh, you don't know a soul. You didn't know anyone, did you? All I heard was Jerry Dominguez, which was the defensive coordinator. I had his phone number written inside my passport that I still have. That was it. I got there. I had some money that I converted over in Australia because I didn't know how it worked here uh, in the US. And then I got there and I had to walk to a payphone. So I fly to LA first, then I fly to Yuma, Arizona, which Yuma, Arizona is like, it's a rough joint. It's on the border, Mexico, Arizona, and California. Oh my God. And um, take this tiny plane, which I thought was barely going to make it. So I get there. It's 120 degrees when I first get there. It's stinking hot. And then um, just walk to the payphone and Tied this guy's dude. number and say, hey, I'm at the airport. I waited 45 minutes. He drove out there, picked me up, and then took me to the school. I went there two weeks early, so I was on school campus. By yourself? No one. So I was just wandering around. I, all I would do was I'd wake up, I'd work out, I'd come back, I'd eat, I'd w- go work out again. All I did that was that for two weeks. Um, and I, I chose to go there early on purpose to, to sort of get myself ready because the heat was a big one. But, um, yeah, it was different. Like, I, I didn't know where. The store was. I didn't know how to get there. There's no Ubers. There's no nothing at this time. So Especially I'm like, then. yeah, I was taking the Shoelace Express. You know what I mean? I was just walking everywhere to figure out. And people started showing up, some of the players and stuff. And it was just like some of the first interactions happened in the U.S. It's just like, well, we better make this good then. I had to set the standard from there. So for me, it was just like I didn't. I didn't go over to make friends. I, I went over there, and I I knew I had to outwork every single person. There was no leniency for being from Australia. There's no quicker, easy route to go to the NFL if you're from Australia. So it was like, well, I got to take it from somebody. I got to beat all these other people. So I got to start now. And that's all I did. Where did all that come from, that focus? I think I did so long not getting or having what I wanted. You sort of get to a point where it's like, got to take it. If I, early on, like I'm a pretty nice guy, you know, I think a lot of it was you try and go and earn stuff and work for it. And it just didn't work for me. I had to change my mindset around, you know, no one is making more money. No one is making more jobs. Nothing is being created anymore. Of. I had to go and take it from somebody else. So it was a different attitude on how I had to approach these things, especially going into a football team where you got four to six spots at a defensive tackle, all my size, all, all Americans, all been playing since the year four years old okay well i'm I'm not going to go earn a spot i have to go in there and fight and rip it out of someone else's lifeless hands so i need to match that intensity and and work ethic or else that's not going to happen like competing with guys that have been doing it for years it's hard it is real hard technically hard too though very there's technical stuff you have to learn man like i it's a brand new sport my background is basketball you know, so I'm going over there and it's just really? like, yeah, I played a little bit of rugby in school. My mom didn't want me to play because she was worried I would hurt other kids because I was so big. And she didn't want me to get in trouble at school, which was going to happen either way. But I had to be over there. Like even in my years in the NFL, I was still learning the game every day. It's not something you go over there and like, hey, let me just give you a crash course in American football. You'll be great once you come out the other side. That's impossible. Because I remember when Jared Hayne went over there and that's the sort of the issue he had. It was learning all the – the calls or the moves yeah, the or plays and the plays it's, yeah it's um it's like playing chess you know what i mean as a coach so you can imagine the the schematics and the the, the changes that happen other than a live game as well and then you put the biggest freakiest humans you can find on earth in there it's um it becomes quite tough um and for me i just knew that if i outworked everyone even if i didn't make it or fell short i would be happy about the effort that was there and that would be the story I would tell. It was about the effort and the intensity I put to it. So when you were lining up, standing opposite, some person is the same sort of structure as you um, and you're thinking to yourself, um, I've got to impress coach here and the, the rest of the staff here. I've got to you know, be better than that dude there. How do you take the fear out of your mind? I didn't really have much, to be honest. Then? Yeah. What, what is it, uh, just youth or what, what do you think? Dan? I don't know. It was definitely, there would be a sprinkle of naivety in there. I think for myself, like, I left the country. I was in a completely different world by myself, different culture. There was a very small slither of safety in that whole environment. So 
well, you got nothing to lose. Yeah, like I literally have nothing to lose. I might as well be the risk instead of be under risk, you know. So for me, it was just going out there, and one of my strengths was strength. The other one was being volatile. So I crazy, just, I just, basically crazy. Pretty much, yeah, as yeah. volatile as you would can imagine, being real tough and. That crazy Aussie bastard, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. I yeah. was the crazy dude. I had a mohawk, tattoos on my face, and if coach said we got to run through brick walls today, then damn, Jesse's most likely going to go first. And that works. That works. Um, I, I've i always had a plan. I had to plan really meticulously how I went about that, and I just had to execute with a, a tenacity that was unmatched. And that's what I had to do, and I had to do it every day. But you see, how quickly did you work out that's your story? Because at the time I'm talking about um, – because you know that's premature. Like you're in um, college, and you know you're you're trying to establish your position. You worked out you got it's quite a mature thing, but you worked out you got nothing to lose. Because by the way, the risk is if you don't. When it comes to fear, if the risk is if you fear tells you to look at risk, but there's also a risk if you let fear take control. There's a risk in relation to that as well. So you can actually get just as hurt if you let fear get in your way. Mm -hmm. So. How did you become so mature about all this, um, you know, and invent the story about yourself? I'm Jesse the Mad Bastard who's a big strong fella. It didn't it, – well, Was that a conscious thing or just no, – just Honestly, it? that's who I am. You know what I mean? These Today? Guys, say. Yeah, still a little bit. I mean, I'm a little – hopefully a little bit less now. But um, at the time, like, I wasn't – it wasn't an act at all by any means. Like, people wanted to find out. I was the person that you'd find out from. Um, it wasn't – conscious in a way that I was like, this is who I have to be. I just woke up being that. I woke up being strong, hardworking. That's all I knew. That's kind of how I was raised. Um, I didn't really have any quit in me. I was happy to die out there. That that was would have been a cooler story to me than failing or giving up and coming back here and 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 you know doing some labor job or something like that. That would have killed me quicker than the risk that was apparent to me. That's interesting because I, I remember once interviewing George Kimbosis, the the fighter. And um, he said to me, and I, I just couldn't believe he said it to me, but I know, I know him quite well and he's got kids, wife, lovely family. And he said to me before he went into fight, his last fight, he said, I'd rather die in the ring than lose the fight. And I said, his wife was sitting there in the podcast and he said, yeah, that's, that's who I am. I'd rather die in the ring. You know, that's a pretty incredible – not many people would say that. Yeah. Or more importantly, wouldn't even get to a point where they consciously thought about that. Mm. You just said something – similar sort of thing. I'd rather die there than come back here as a as having failed. Pretty much, yeah. Like that. that's pretty much how I played. I had very little regard for my body. And, you know, I've told my parents multiple times when I was playing, like if anything ever happens and I break my neck or other things, I was like, do not keep me around. I used to tell my dad Pull that the all plug. the time. Pull the plug. I was like, let me go how I'm supposed to go. I was like, I'm not here gripping onto hopes and wishes and have you guys look after me. I'm like, nah, let me go. I was like, I'm out here. I'm playing like that sacrifice means something to me. And it does. Like you go to war every day with these guys. If you saw some of the guys had to go against, you'd realize it's a war real quick. And um, it's a conscious decision at the time, but it's too easy for me at the time. I want it no other way. Well, did you ever, Did you ever sort of wake up in the middle of the night and sort of say, what the fuck? And what am I doing? Like, uh, this, this has consequences. Yeah, I mean, I've I had about 10, 11 surgeries in my time there. Um, you know, when I was in college, college was a lot harder. Um, you know, you're under resourced, you're not getting paid or anything at the time. And, um, you know, I used to have my, my college girlfriend at the time pretty much have to stay over because I would play so hard, I would barely, I would rarely sleep until like the Sunday or Monday. Take me through that. So you'd play on, say, the Saturday? Saturday, yeah. So and what happened? Uh, you, you would just have so much adrenaline and like the painkillers and everything like that playing that like when that wore off, your nervous system was just firing. Shot. So like I pretty much have her there. So if I like just make sure that I'm still like breathing if I do fall asleep um, because of the intensity that you're playing. Like I'm all worried about like my brain, my heart and all those things now. But at the time when I'm playing, I had no regard for anything. That type of football lasts for a long time and it's sort of quite di it's different the way we watch rugby league and rugby union, et cetera, in Australia. Ours is shorter and sort of um, more heart and lung full on. Mm -hmm. um, that you're getting up, rolling, moving all the time. The game that you played, though, is very structured, 
but intense in short bursts, mm. like but intense. And yeah. when you have a collision, it's massive collision. When you got home at night, I mean, did they, for a start, did they put you through the cold baths and the, you know, all the physio and all that sort of stuff? When you were at college, did you go through all that process or you just yeah, had a look yeah, after you yourself? Yeah, you had all those things um, for sure. It give you some um, anti-inflammatories? Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's like some packets of Advil and a Gatorade and you'll be fine. Um, yeah, that, that definitely was there. Like it wasn't from the lack of support or resource or anything like that. It was more just the intensity and like, you know, a very structured game, but the game also relies heavily on the types of teams as well. So we play, I played at the number one school in the country at Alabama. And, um, so you're playing against the best players in the country every game. So the intensity and then the, the duration of that, how many plays you have to play. It's like getting hit by a car 50 times in a, in really? a game. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, you were, by the way, they would feel like they've been hit by a truck when you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was the car, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Um, so I think a lot of it, um, is really just like your body feeling off that as well as, um, your mental highs and lows from that. Like playing in front of 110,000 people every week. That's mad. It's not something you get used to. Um, you kind of acclimate to some extent to play and, and you sort of understand the game, but you got 110,000 in the stadium, another 150 outside. And I got to try and walk back to my truck or try and get home. Like it's in a tense situation. So your nervous system is just firing. Um, it's it's like on any, anything I can compare it to in Australia. But is it like a high? It is, yeah. I was lucky it was a lot of highs because we won a lot. But the lows, and they they come. I only lost two games in my college career. Wow. Um, but they were they were tough games. And like when you play at a school that is used to winning, losing is not good. Um, but a lot of it was just like the mental mix with the, a lot of the physical contact and and the build up and it's just intense, especially playing in front of that many people and knowing you're on TV, like the game, every game means something. And it's, um, you never know when it's your last. And I used to like playing. I, I really got a kick out of knowing that this could be my last game right here. I could die tonight, you know, touch wood. But Do you guys, does that happen to people? Yeah, the, the, yeah. Yeah. A lot of it, like, you know, hard stuff, you can die. Um, I mean, in the U S a lot of it is, there's a risk with a lot of things, you know, driving, being around anywhere, there's a risk of that. But I think for myself was, um, I had to have that mentality. That was what, it's always been intrinsic for me. And it was, it's always been like a little bit of a battle. And um, that was part of it for me. It was, it, it was, it was firing me. It was, that was, was, was keeping me there. I didn't want to play if it was easy. I didn't want to play if everyone can do it. I didn't want to play if it was like no risk. It was nothing on the line. Um, I tell people all the time I was, I was made for the fourth quarter. And that's what I like. I like the pressure. I like being a little, not scared, but nervous, you know. Um, and that I was lucky enough to get that a lot playing in some big, big stadiums. And how, how did you deal with um, people holding you up as being the great Aussie defensive player, like big dude, yeah. damaging everybody reputationally? How did you deal with that? Let's call it fame. Yeah, I honestly, I, I, I talk to people about it a lot. I, I didn't listen to a single thing. Um, I think one of the things I feel my parents are most proud of is I'm very close to the same person as when I came back. Obviously, grew and progressed in other ways, but I stayed true to what it was. And when I was over there, Australian media showed no love whatsoever. You know what I mean? They didn't, you know, they were doing what Australian media does, right? Um, but the US media, the world media that was shining on me when I was doing well and winning. They'll kind and, you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, I, never, I didn't believe in any of it. You know, I, that, that was part of sort of me humbling myself to death a little bit. Um, I didn't want to get swayed either way. You know, I, I, I pride myself on being a little bit unshakable and not influenced real well from negative stuff, but even more so from positive stuff. I just try and stay true to my values and what I need to get done. People telling me how good and how strong and how handsome I was, that didn't really help me. You know what I mean? Even though I knew I was handsome, it just didn't help me at the time, you know? Um, so I had to stay true to myself, and that was where the grounding part came because I just never thought I I made it, never thought I did well. I just kept chasing, kept chasing. It's really hard to satisfy me in, in any sort of performance factor. I like that humbling myself to death. Where does that come from? I don't know, it sort of just came to mind. <laughs> but like, is it, a, it sort of sounds very Aussie in some respects, um, or is that more your community or is that who uh, you thought you were? It's a little bit of being raised like that. And I think for myself, it's like, it's probably wrapped up tightly in a little bit of self-doubt. Um, you know, when you put yourself on a pedestal, it's, 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 it puts a bit of a target on your back, especially in Australia. Um, but for me, it was it was just my way of staying true to what I had to do. 
All I had to do was keep the main thing, the main thing. And I was here to play football. I wasn't here to make friends. I wasn't here to be popular. I wasn't here to do anything. I never even, when I left, it had nothing about the NFL came to mind. It was like, just get over there. Just play football. Just do well. Just don't come back here. You know, um, that's what helped sort of keep me on that line. It's pretty, and I often say this about uh, good sports people, in my, my view, my theory, uh, people who get to the top of any sport, I don't care what sport it is, generally speaking, have a, a high EQ, emotional intelligence and uh, normal intelligence as well, um, mainly because it's not just about your talent, your physical talent. There's so many intellectual things you have to navigate, so many challenges. There are just as many emotional and intellectual challenges put in front of great sports people as you get better and better and better as there are physical challenges. Did you consciously think about it? Not consciously. For me at the time, it was like I took this like adapt or die mentality. And that it, the football was a very small slither of the life that encompassed being over there. Totally. Still had to go to school. I had to still get a degree. I had to navigate. Did that, is that a compulsory thing, is it? it going to school is compulsory yep. for sure. Getting a degree was uh, what I told my mom I would do. It yep. allowed me to leave the country. Yep. Um, and I think um, – people sort of underestimate that as well. Like I went to a very prestigious four-year university, graduated. I was all-American academic, dean's list, president's list. You know, there's not much more I could have done in the classroom as well. I think for myself, as I, I took the attitude across all boards. You know what I mean? I didn't go to, I didn't really go to parties. I didn't do all that other stuff. I just focused on stuff I knew would push me closer to what my goal was. Was that keeping it simple though? Yeah, it was just, I, I didn't want to complicate the life that I had. Yeah, simple, com- non-complicated is yeah, what you're saying, yeah. as opposed to giving simple. I probably didn't say the right word. Don't complicate stuff. Yeah, like the path is laid. Those big schools, the support, it's just there for you to navigate. And you navigate that with your effort and your intent to what you want to do. And that's all I did. I just showed up and worked hard. And that, that's that been the my life in a nutshell. Just show up and work hard. When I got to the US, it was show up and outwork everybody else to your utmost ability. And But the showing, showing up part is important um, because there's a lot of times where emotionally, like just as a man, prideful-wise, you don't want to show up or you think it's you know it's something else. But I just showed up every day and I made sure my effort was there. To me, you know, how I did the little things was how I did everything. How I did my playbook or how I did my my stance when I played in the NFL was how I studied, was how I read books, was made sure I get my degree. It's the same way I approach learning about other teams is how I learn about business or how I learn about, you know, other situations I'm, I'm going into. Um, it was just, it was just who I was. It was just, I had to work hard and I just found my ways to do it. You know, by no means am I a genius or I had the, the blueprint set out that like, hey, this is the best way to get a degree or play in the NFL. It was all through failure. It was all through learning, through mistakes, and but I couldn't make those mistakes if I didn't show up. Was your support group? You had a set. You said had a girlfriend. You probably had a couple of girlfriends throughout the period. But did you have mates around you? Like, did you de- develop, you know, footy mates or college mates? Um, it's hard. Like, I did. I did have a few friends. It was like I had my roommate and some other guys, and I didn't really know a lot. You know, like I was still learning about. Like what people, what this restaurant sort of does, like what what this side of town is like. I was learning very basic stuff. Um, you know, once I got all the other hard stuff taken care of, um, you know, but most of my support base was like I would talk to my family maybe once every three months on Skype. You know, we had no FaceTime or nothing back then, um, so it was just Skype. And then the rest was honestly me. Like it, I, I didn't. I don't like relying on friends or I'm, I'm very intrinsically driven, like, to, like I would say 99.9% intrinsic and I'm very hard to be swayed. I wanted to learn those mistakes and I wanted to find out I'm an interested person. I'm like, you're curious. Yeah. I'm like, what's this guy doing? I'm like, you know, what, what, what is this about? What's this, you know? Um, and that's what opened the connections up and talking to people and everything like that. But majority was my family and myself um, because I knew I was, I was transient, you know, I was um, from college to college, hopefully to the NFL. Like I was just like, as long as I can rely on myself to get all these things do, done, then I can I can keep going. Do you remember the, the, when you got drafted? I do, yeah. NFL? Did, well, did you take me through that one? Man, it was – it wasn't a negative thing. It was definitely a positive thing. But I was supposed to – I was I was rated first round. 
Um, and then I tore my knee up playing in the championship game, which we won. Um, you know, which is all part of football. I would, nothing I would change about that. What do you mean you tore your knee up? What do you mean? Uh, I tore a bunch of stuff in my knee, uh, PCL, LCL, MCL, the meniscus. Lot, yeah. yeah. Uh, everything but ACL. Yeah. Um, came back and played, you know, played on it, won the national championship. And I slid, slid to the fifth round, even though I was rated for the first round, which was fine. For me, it was never about money. It was just about foot and door. So, um, but I do remember I had, I had my three phones. Uh, don't ask me why I had three iPhones at the time. Um, and I just remember I was sitting in my apartment for the first round just by myself. My family couldn't come over. There's no point. They were watching a little bit back in Australia. And I was just like, it's not like me just to sit and wait for these opportunities. So first day I watched, it only goes for a few hours. I didn't get picked in the first round. That's fine. I call my agent and tell him, just call me when something happens. And the rest of the time, I pretty much just worked out. The next day, I was in the gym. I was on the field, all that sort of stuff. Because I knew no matter what number I went, I had to jump on a plane like everybody else and be ready to play as soon as I landed. And then um, on the third day, I remember seeing the number come up. My agent called me. And he was like, San Diego Chargers is going to take you. And I'm like, cool, 136 or 137. And I'm like, all right, cool. And then on the same exact phone, Washington number comes up. It's like, hey, so we're going to take you right now. I'm like, is this the Chargers? And they're like, nah, it's the Seahawks. I was like, what the hell's going on? And then it came up on the TV. The Seattle jumped up, I think, one or two spots to take me because the Chargers were going to take me. And um, I remember getting the call, and I spoke to John Snyder, who's the GM, and uh, Dan Quinn was the DC at the time. And it was crazy. Like, I was there by myself. I actually got the call while I was in the gym at Alabama. I was training. Um, and it was funny because that's very, if you know me from a young age, I spent a lot of time in the gym, so it only makes sense to get the call in the gym. And, um, yeah, it was cool. For me, you know, it was a 15-minute phone call, a few texts, and then finish my workout and, you know. Pack your bags. It's, it's all starts again, you know. Yeah, For yeah. me, it was like full circle moment of like, man, you can make some stuff happen, man. Like, this is crazy. Um, what do you do to celebrate? What do you do? I didn't do anything. I just finished my workout and went and grabbed some food and went home. Like, um, I, like I, said, I wasn't a drinker or a smoker. I didn't, wasn't a party guy. I didn't really have anyone at the time. So it was just like, I just got to be sharp, be ready. You know, I was <laughs> locked in was an understatement. I was, I was dialed. I was, I, I knew it was coming. So like I had nothing else really to distract me. I want to get a sense of the injuries that you've had to bear. Oh man, they didn't start in the NFL, and I had everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, before yeah. that, prior to that, but yeah, heaps. You know, the ones before, like stress fractures, my neck, feet, um, knees busted up. That's just part of the position. You know, broken fingers, dislocated this, dislocated that. Um, but then in the, in the NFL was really um, it wasn't no crazy injuries besides my last one. The other ones were two just really small ones. It was more just the timing. So it was both. First year was my knee. Um, someone landed into me while we were practicing, and um, it's football can't do nothing about it. It's not my place to complain about other people being on the field. Um, second year was the other knee, kind of similar. Uh, end up finding out it was a weird shaped meniscus in my knee that caused me to hit that right there. And then my third year, obviously, was kidney cancer. That was probably like the icing on the cake. Do you think it had anything to do with playing football? The cancer? Mm. You know what's funny? When I first got diagnosed, I, I I I asked them. Like I'm an interested person. I'm like, please tell me what caused this. Like if it's some sort of protein, if I need to stop eating something or drinking something, you tell me. And he said, this type of cancer is just bad luck. So I just said, well, man, make sure you cut that bad luck out as well when you when you get it out. Um, but that was it, man. Like it was just the epitome of, um, things can be taken at any time. The thing that went through my mind when I was a kid, I was always told that, you know, we sort of won't punch each other in the arm or when you go around punching someone in the arm and someone, one of the parents once told me that, uh, if you keep doing that, um, you're going to give that person cancer. And I often used to think to myself that if you, you know, like for, say for example, your kidney, if you got kept getting hit in the ribs or around that territory or the a shutter you know, does it change the shape or change the, you know, maybe the DNA or the cellular structure of your kidney? 
can it, can that create a cancer? That was what was going through my mind when we we're talking about it just then. Mm. Um, and you know, because I I guess we're always looking for something to blame. How come Jesse's not the dude who tries to find something to blame? Just copped it on the chin, like because it seems like everything that happened to you is I'm just going to cop it on the chin. I'm going to go with it. You're that type of person. Yeah, I didn't feel entitled enough to fight back, and like in a weird way, I was just like, ah, oh, stuff like this happens. <laughs> when it's really funny because when I was really young, I was like, if I ever get to write a book about my life and like try and tell my kids or my future grandkids or whatever about how my life was, I got to make this story really good. And that's how, you know, that's why I chose Alabama being such a hard school because no one ever thought I would make it there. And I played every game, national championships. Same with the NFL or, or half these other things. Like when I'm writing a book, which I'm trying to do at the moment, and I get to cancer, if I just write it like, oh, no, nah, then he quit and went home and he was all good, that would be a shitty story. You know what I mean? So I was like, man, I'm just going to run straight at this thing. I was like, nothing else killed me up to this point against all odds. Let's see how this goes. Um, and I just treated it like I had the flu. Like I remember the exact time they told me. I remember that like it was a movie playing in my head. And um, I just never bought into it. Like I had um, found out on a Tuesday, we put the media release out on a Wednesday and I was going in for surgery on a Thursday. Like the world erupted. My phone, I had calls from everywhere, every coach, player I ever played with, whatever. Great support. And um, I was supposed to be in hospital for four or five days, whatever. I go in there. I have this kidney surgery. It takes like eight or nine hours, whatever. They took it out. As soon as I woke up, I said, I need to get the fuck out of here. I was like, I'm not sitting in this hospital. Like, it's, it's real quiet. It smells real clean. Like, I, I don't belong here. So she said, the, the doctor said, if you, you have to stand up by yourself, uh, take the catheter out, which, by the way, the catheter is the worst part of having any type of surgery. You mean? Yeah. Like that is fucked yeah. up. And I was, awake, I was awake when she took it out. That's fucked up. I've and it was it. like, she was playing tug of war with oh me. You God. know what I mean? <laughs> oh, it's, it's like, fair. It was making um, me feel weird. Just even, I've had it done. It just makes me feel weird thinking about yeah, it's, it. Yeah, it's a deep feeling. Um, and then uh, <laughs> Very deep. she said, you know, if you walk around the, the ward twice, you can go. So I have this surgery. I've been in this hospital 16 hours. My parents are coming from my house right now with get well balloons and flowers and all this other crap. And by the time they get there, I've walked around the ward, got changed, took the catheter out, and I'm ready to go. And I I drive my truck from the hospital. Serious? Seriously. Like it would have been 20 hours tops, and that's giving a little bit of leeway. They wheeled me out into the, the parking lot in a wheelchair. I stood up and just jumped in my truck with my family, and I was like, all right, I'm out. And so then that's so Australian. Yeah. And then I, I stopped at the facility in Seattle and everyone was still there practicing, getting ready. And everyone saw me like, oh man, when's the surgery? When's the surgery? I'm like, oh, yeah, I had it yesterday. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm like, I had, you know, um, I had nine incisions. I was bleeding and stuff out of all of them, all split out. You probably had a bag on it, did you? No, nah, no bag. No, nah, everything was all sealed up, thank like, God. Yeah. And then um everyone was freaking out. They're like, what the hell are you doing here? I was like, Oh, they said I could leave. Like, I wasn't going to sit in there. Like, I'm fine. They took it. These mad bastard. Yeah. And then I just went home and, you know, I remember. Collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, there was seven weeks, five days till the first preseason game. And everyone's like, oh, Jesse has to take the year off. Jesse's got to take two years. Like, it's a major organ all sort of stuff. I told my dad, I remember sitting there before the surgery because um, I actually posted on my Instagram yesterday. He took a photo of me. I said, take a photo of me sitting on this bed. And I posted on my Instagram and said, no fear in my heart. This was right before surgery because I, I could have died. And um, after he took the picture I posted, and I said, I got seven weeks, five days. I said, I'm going to come back and, and play. I said, I, I need something. And um, everyone was like, you know, kind of like, yeah, yeah, okay. Like sort of brushed me off like, damn, Jesse's fucking you. crazy in the head, man. So I was like, as soon as I got this surgery, got all these bandages, all this crap. Um, so I was like, all right, seven weeks, four days. I'm like, first preseason game, San Diego. I got to get ready. And at this time, everyone still thinks, damn, Jesse's maybe got a little bit of a screw loose here. Something's wrong. So then as soon as I could walk, I was running a little bit. As soon as I could lift weights, I was lifting every day. As soon as I could put any pressure on everything, I was going. As soon as I could practice, I was out there full speed. And I was involved in every step of the way. And then, fuck, crazy thing. Seven weeks, five days later, Jesse runs out there starting against San Diego. What was coach saying? He, well, he said, you're fucking crazy. Um, and they, they sort of knew as well. They were just like, man, 
they you, they couldn't really jump in front of me. Like it was like no, yeah. like they were like, I said this is what the goal is, and we're going to work towards that. They said all right, we'll see how you go. I was like no, I'm like that's what the goal is, is what we're doing. So I ended up coming back. I played all four preseason games. Played pretty good, and um, as you can imagine, like I was wrecked. I was going to say, what's the side effect of it that, like, after playing the game with one kidney, like, what, what happens? Um, you, well, for starters, my body was not used to it yeah. at all. I was still bleeding. I split all the stitches, so I got some pretty crazy scars. I've already I tattooed over them, but some pretty crazy scars because I split all the stitches trying to play football. And um, I split them so many times, I just got sick of it. They were just like, we're not stitching them up anymore. Um, but I think the biggest thing was just my nervous system, all of my adrenals, everything was just, it's like, yeah, you Exhausted. were dying. Like, this is not something. Hormones, everything was all whacked out. And I was trying to do everything clean. After the surgery, I took no painkillers. I only took CBD because it was all legal in the state of Washington. I didn't take nothing. And um, by the time the fourth preseason game came around, walking upstairs from like our lower level, like weight room to like meeting rooms was like a workout. And I was like, I was playing out of my skin just to be a practice, you know? And um, I didn't want that. I couldn't live with that. I couldn't take another hardworking person's spot playing average. You know what I mean? Just, I didn't, based, just based, because, because of your reputation, you couldn't do it. Yeah. 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 Uh, it, for myself internally, I couldn't. And I, I watched the last game on film and I was playing good, but I was like, I'm looking a bit slower. You know, I don't look as strong. Is that the sort of person um, I want to be remembered for? And it wasn't, you know, and I worked with a team and I spoke to John and, and Coach Carroll and it was like, man, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do this, you know? Um, and then obviously fast forward, I was like, yeah, no, nah, I can't do it. So I, I finished up there in Seattle and, you know, props to Seattle. Like they helped me the whole way through and looked after me mentally and physically through that because I still didn't, you know, really have heaps of support or anything around me. Um, and yeah, it was probably the, not the ending I wanted for a career, but like everything else, I just was like, okay, that's it. Then what's next? We'll move on to something else, you know? How do you come out of these things financially at the end of the day? Like, are you okay? Like, you know, like- Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah, well, you do well enough yeah, during we the period. Yeah, we were doing well, yeah. And like, I was lucky enough that I was never defined by football. I was always doing so much other stuff, especially like speaking, other business stuff. I was just always wanted to be involved in other things. So I promised myself, you know, when I started figuring out, okay, I'm going to do this for a little bit. Until the age of 35, I just wanted to do as much as I possibly can. If I if I make it to being an old man, I just wanted to be those guys that are like, man, I used to do this. I've done this before. I've done this. My story already seems like that for some reason. Um, I just wanted to get experience. I was already traveling the world. I was around really cool people, amazing athletes, coaches, men and women. I was like, ah, oh, I just got to learn from all these people and help them do this, help them do this. So that's where, for me, it was like really from a receiving role, whether it was confirmation, attention, love, to more of a serving role. Um, and that's when I went back to coach. Um, and that's sort of what's led me to all the stuff we do now with football and like giving back. Um, it just made sense to me. It, it, I never wanted to, I could have signed with other teams and tried to go again and, and push it and grind myself. I, but that time faded out. That was one phase in my life. Now I had to move on to the next one. Um, and I just had to come to terms with that. Did you ever at any point line up against some an opposition and look in their eyes and think to yourself, oh, my God, this dude's a beast? Yeah, I mean... Playing at Alabama, the number one school, I played against absolute dogs every day. And, um, you know, we used to fight, you punch on, you play and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think the best guys I ever played against were the guys I were on my team. and um, On your team in Alabama. Yeah. yeah. And that's because I knew how much effort they were putting in. So if they were still there with me and I'm crazy, I'm like, okay, this guy's, <laughs> this guy's for real then. Um, and then it just becomes like a who wants it more, right? Um, but, yeah, there's plenty of guys, I mean – you just look at some of the pictures of the guys that play in the NFL, especially yeah. like defensive linemen. Some of these guys, man, some of the Afri uh, American Afri uh, Af African American guys, um, these are like created players. These guys are like aliens, man. You brought some of these guys to Australia, they would scare people out here. Um, so and just playing against in terms of, st structure, st statue wise. Yeah, absolutely. Like I played against 
DJ Fluker, he played Alabama with me. He was about 6'9", probably 6'10", played at about 380 pounds and was running. Like, he wasn't a big fat dude. Like, he was just a big human being. And it was just like, I remember him getting a picture of my dad. My dad's like 5'7", or 5'8", and like standing next to him. And it was just like, like, what the hell? Like, I was showing my parents and my grandparents back in Australia. And it was just like, what? You got to go. I got to go against him and another person trying to block me. Two people. And yeah, it's just it's unlike anything in Australia. Just different breed of people, man. It's funny we, we have a we have, there's a young you might know him. I don't know if you know him. But there's a young fella here. He's probably in his twenties. His name's um, Alex Simons. His name nickname is Godly Strong, and um, he's about six five. He was the strongest man in Australia at one stage, you, you know, bench and all that sort of stuff. And uh, he's 195 kilos, and. Uh, He's a now. He's now trying to get in the UFC. But he's a boxer and an MMA fighter now, much lighter. But I remember seeing him when he was 195 kilos, and I thought to myself, "What the hell is my? It's like a mountain, and and he can you know uh, deadlift 450 kilos and bench press 280 kilometer. What the hell? Uh, but move beautiful. Mm. Like there are people in this world, and, and you would see him in the NFL all the time. Yeah, yeah, giants, but who can actually move. Beautifully. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy how how fast some of these guys are. Like running the 40, jumping a vert, you know, like can single leg squat this much and run, play basketball, like, you know, dunk a basketball weighing as much as I do. Like it's crazy for a lot of these guys. Um, I just don't think we see a lot of caliber athletes like that in Australia. Obviously, it's population and, you know, hyper competitive nature of population as well. Sort of trim it down to these elite level guys. But yeah, it's, it's a different world. It took a while for me to get used to. That's why I had to work so hard. As soon as I saw some guys that I by no means am gifted with half the stuff some of the guys I played with. Talent-wise, you mean? Yeah, yeah talent. Yeah. Like, like God-given talent. Some of these guys come out ready to go where I had to like really had to have an extra work ethic and a little bit more um, validity behind some of the things I was doing to, to get to their level. What's your strongest characteristic do you reckon that helped you successfully – get drafted into the NFL and get through all that um, college football, et cetera. And just to get you to America and on your own and do what you did, what, what do you think is probably your best characteristic? I think like grit, like being unshakable um, and just be able to wake up and show up, push through. Not one part of the pathway has been like, man, I just sailed through and it was easy. Everything has been an uphill battle. And if you – if you're not comfortable being uncomfortable, then it ain't going to be for you. Um, and I think grit was the only thing that got me through. Grit. Like, like the that. surgeries, the getting knocked down, getting back up, getting knocked down, getting back up. You know, every little, not just football, like all the outside stuff, schooling and all that. Man, you want to quit every day. And the grit and all that, and my resiliency around that, which is, you know, if I feel like is wrapped around grit, that is what was stopping me. Like, we ain't done yet. You know, you're not done yet. The and mission's in front of me and I'm going to complete the mission. Yeah. And that honestly, that's how I am now. Like there's plenty of stuff where I could just like, oh, yeah, let's just cruise and do that. I don't want to cruise. Like I, I like being uncomfortable. I like challenge. Um, especially now I want to help people and helping people is a very hard business. There's a lot of challenge in that. So cool. That's what we're going to do, you know. And um, I think I don't want to lose that skill. I'm trying to lean into it. You know, it's a whole new form of learning too. You got to learn a whole new lot of skills, especially yeah. Like right now, we're doing a lot in the U.S. and here, and a lot of it is those skills are so different in different places. You got to be real sharp and be able to communicate. You got to be able to listen really well, and um, that, that's kind of the battles I'm dealing with at the moment. Yeah, but they're, they are new skills. Got nothing to do with just charging through or knocking dudes over. Yeah, it's about. You got to do that, but it's in a sort of intellectual way. You got to do it, yeah. And you can't. You, you got to be kind at the same time. I, I do want to ask you this, so Jesse, like, and I think this is an important thing. For, I'd like to know this. When you were killing it over there, and if you came back to Australia, which I no doubt you did to visit family, whatever, what was it like for you to go back to where your family lived? Um, I loved it. You know, I never really, like I said before, I didn't buy into like the fame or celebrity component. I didn't really enjoy it, to be honest. So when I came back to Australia, because the NFL back then wasn't that big. 
So like I would come back and like no one would recognize me. And I was like, this is awesome. But like if I go to the US, like I'm getting stopped everywhere in Alabama, everywhere in Seattle. Um, so I loved coming back and being able to, I would do it in really short stints. I might do a week a year, uh, two weeks a year, maybe. And then, um, yeah, I would just stay with my parents. or, you know, hang out, work out, live like nothing around me had changed at all. From when you were a kid, from a kid, like get soak up that for, for a hot minute and then back to work. You know, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want it to put blood in the water. Like that's something I, I wanted or. Um, something that uh, was driving me because it wasn't. It was just a small piece of, you know, some memories and spending time with my family and then it was back to what was real. How conscious did you become though of not coming back with a big head? Yeah, I, I, I didn't feel like I had a big head at all. I think for me, I, I never felt like I made it. You know, I came back and, you know, one trip was one national championship, another one, another national championship, another one, the Super Bowl. And it's just like the whole time, like a Super Bowl ring, like it, it sits in my house in a safe. Like I don't wear it every day. I wear it like three or four times a year. And the rest of the rings are like still there. I hardly ever take them out. And I never bought into it. I, I tell a lot of people like, don't take me on my my last wins. I was like, take me on my, my next ones that are coming. Um, and I think that really put me in a good headspace to be like, I'm, I'm not worth any more than anybody else. My value is like, what is right now? If I just went around and told, and, and I take it with a grain of salt because it kind of, I, I don't like telling my story all the time because I feel like people think I'm like gassing myself up, which I'm not. Um, I'd rather just be living like what I'm doing right now. You know, for myself, it's just like, I just want to keep winning. I'm not worried about those last wins. That's done. Nothing I can change. Great story. Cool. I'm over it. Like, what's next? Are we talking about a form of humility, though, or are you talking, or do you, or is it beyond humility? You just think, listen, I'm a, I'm interested in what I'm doing now, or I'm going to do, as opposed to what I have it's done. It's a mix of humility, but also like I don't want my thoughts to be saturated on all the previous stuff. I just want to be able to affect people and help and do that, and like that's never determined on how many rings I have, all the stuff I've done. Was it great? Sure, and it builds a certain platform or or around maybe how I speak or, or what I say to certain people, but take me on right now, who I am, what we're still doing, um, the presence we still hold. Um, don't get me wrong. I love the journey. I love the story. I just don't buy into it enough to use it as a leverage point to, to build anything now, um, not in a egotistical way. That's a very intellectual decision though. Um, you're still a young man, my, my books anyway, but that's a very intellectual decision to make um, that – Yep, good story, blah blah blah. But really, understand who I am right now and what I want to do for the future. That that's that, there's a lot of consciousness in that. Uh, yeah, I think I never wanted to be defined by football. You know, whenever I come back to Australia, people are always like NFL this, NFL that. You know what I mean? Like my name is Jesse. Um, got a dual degree from the University of Alabama. I've got this, 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 and this, and that. Maybe at the end of it, you can add how many rings I got. You know. Um, so I think that's sort of where that leads into. I never really did want it to be defined by football. So I was always, I have to not be defined by football. I have to push into some other areas. And um, I have to be able to start getting some wins in those areas and push myself and do that. And that's all I wanted to do. Because it's a long road with very few turns and, it was, and you're only young. You've got a long, long way to go. Yeah. Well, I tell people all the time, like, if my life is this long, football is this. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, what, I'm supposed to talk for another 50, 60 years about <laughs> – Totally. Super Bowl national championship, like man. Uh, hopefully, touch wood. The work we're putting in right now, we're going to make much greater wins than the ones I've had. Well, then I'm going to ask you, Jesse, today. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? What do you want to achieve? I, mean, I think for myself, with the the growth of football, we've spent the last few years working in indigenous community, the youth space. The youth is really important to me um, because that was me, you know. And no one ever stuck their hand out to help me. No one ever showed me other things to do. I had to sort of fall into what I find it myself. So right now we're working really hard around football, American football, um, and getting kids to the U.S. And it's huge at the moment. Football is growing exponentially in Australia. The NFL Australia now has an office in the Gold Coast. There's so much more happening. For me, I don't care about sending guys to the NFL. I care about taking kids from here that are not going to make it into a – I don't think a very successful rugby league, rugby union pathway to get them on a pathway to get a degree in college, to be able to travel 
and experience that um, because that changed my life exponentially more than football ever would. Um, so working really hard with that at the moment, um, Gridiron Australia, the local national body here pushing that. I'm putting all my effort into that um, because if I can have such a positive impact on my community and I send another 100 kids and then another 100 kids after that, man, Lord knows the positive impact it will come from getting that many kids out of the situations that are currently in Australia, whether it's Western suburbs of Sydney, south side of Brisbane, all that sort of stuff like that. You know what I mean? Um, so working really hard with that at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a, a facility built in Brisbane to house these kids um, and, and work really closely with, with the government to try and get some kids out of here. I just think the opportunity of being in the U.S. around that many influential people positively in a system, whether it's sport or, or, or um, academics, is life-changing. And it would be unjust me being the only one here that have the capabilities, the connects, and the the learnings, um, anecdotal learnings, to be able to help these guys. I have to do that. Um, so we're putting a lot of effort behind that at the moment. I really enjoy it. Um, there's going to be so much more attention coming from the NFL now with Jordan and a bunch of other kickers like Nathan Chapman from Pro Kick in Melbourne sending guys every week over there. Um, and I just think there's so many guys like Jordan that don't fit the rugby mold that – Okay, you have the option of staying here, being a laborer, working in whatever, which is not a bad thing, or you have the opportunity to go over and, yeah, sacrifice a lot for a few years, but look at the outcomes, you know? Um, so that's what we're pushing at the moment, uh, working really hard around that and football and just trying to not be an influencer, but just be a positive influence. And is that, does that mean you go to schools or how do you how do you tell the story? I mean, or how do you get out in front of them? Yeah, so at the moment, working really hard. We actually have camps and combines around the country. And how do they find these places? Uh, just through social media and stuff like that, like a Gridiron Australia, myself, usually a big one. Um, so at the moment, we're going through, <laughs> we're working again brands and other people on board, obviously, to make it essentially free for all these kids. But we're going to have camps and combines around the country. Because the talent is out there. I did a bunch of camps at the end of last year, and I would have found 50 kids that could have went to Division One schools. Wow. And it's like, that's for free. Um, so we just recently set up the First Step Foundation, which is my family's foundation, so that we can help raise funds to help get kids from here to the actual school and get them equipment and all that sort of stuff. Um, because I think the path that I took is uh, – probably not feasible for, for everybody. Um, I don't want them living off ramen noodles and fresh air like I was. Um, probably a bit better path will make it a little bit more longevity along the lines of that. So we're working with that, camps and combines. Uh, we will try and push a little bit more into the schools. And obviously, it's still growing as a sport. As you can imagine, Super Bowl's popularity is going tenfold. Totally. So um, I really want to capitalize on that. Um, and a lot of companies that work the US to Australia and vice versa, are also, you know, they know how big a, a catalyst sport can play in that uh, sort of global environment. So it's really exciting at the moment. Man, it's an amazing opportunity for a lot of kids that fell out of the union system or too big for league system or getting too big for basketball. Like, man, find me on social media because the U.S. schools hit me up on a daily basis um, just because I'm the only one out here and they just want big kids. So the U.S. schools are looking to you to sort of help them recruit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure absolutely. You. Well, you know, it makes me feel old, but a lot of guys I played with are now coaches at some of those bigger schools. So I post a few photos from our camps and, you know, some of these kids are getting so big. They make me look normal in some of these photos. So, yeah. They'd be, and they'd be too big for rugby league or rugby. Yeah, way too big. Yeah. So it's like, but way too big for rugby is perfect for me. You know what yeah. I mean? Give us a few months. Like, we'll work with you, get some film together. And these schools, they're not looking out here for NFL Hall of Famers. They're looking for raw potential projects that, hey, as long as you're coachable and want to work hard, they'll do the rest. Which is what you – that's how you presented yourself. Exactly. I'm coachable and I'll work hard. Absolutely. I never went over – not one part of that story was like, I'm a good player. It was just like, tell me what we need to do and I'll just do it as best I possibly can. And that's, that's all they're looking for. And Australia is in an abundance of big kids at the moment that are sort of stuck. Rugby league and union, the game is getting a lot more athletic, a lot yeah. faster. So those bigger kids are getting pushed further and further out to the rim. So, man, I just want to kind of lay the opportunity for those kids because, man, get to a high school, get to a college for free just to play football. 
there is no places in Australia that can offer you that. Yeah, and I because I actually love the the academic side of all at least you know the the, the education piece. That's a big deal. A lot of these kids who never get that opportunity well, here in Australia. Hey, someone could steal this ring from me. I could lose my watch. I could lose everything else, but they'll never take my degrees. Look, yeah, take the piece of paper. The rest is here. It's on my name. Yeah, yeah. So like that stuff's important to me because it has lineage around it and you buy into traditions of universities and being a part of something greater than yourself. Um, but just the sheer opportunity of like, even if you go over and get a degree, getting a job, coming back, knowing people you've traveled, you've got a, a degree from a prestigious university in a different country. Like it has weight um, more than going to TAFE here, even though that's not bad. It's more just there's other opportunities. But there's all the experience that goes with it too. Like the whole experience and the maturity you get out of these sort yeah. of things. Why is Jesse Williams, why do you want to do this? What's what's the reason? I just why want to pay forward what, what you did. I just know that I, yes, probably worked hard and got all the things, but there's some greater life scheme around me having all the things I was able to get. Um, and I don't, I'm not competing with anyone here. I'm the only person in Australia that has any of the stuff that I have. Um, and it would be silly for me not to, you know what I mean? It's, it's not um, an obligation. Yeah, it's like... No one helped me when I was coming up. That's fine. That doesn't mean that's how I have to be. Um, and, you know, traveling around, right now it's working with football, but I want football to breach into, you know, indigenous, specific communities to create other, other opportunities. Sports for myself has always been the adhesive in my life and catalyst for change in community. And I'm just trying to strengthen that with a different sport with much better opportunities for longevity, pre, during, and post-career, you know, there's opportunities coming out of playing American football, which unlike most sports in Australia. And it's important for me because I meet a lot of kids, I've been around a lot of programs, I coach a lot of football, and people need these role models, they need opportunities, they need these leverage points more than just, hey, do you want to be a, a tradie, you know, you can do this or this. I want to be able to expose these kids to something different. Um, and the NFL can see the opportunity here. Um, so it only makes sense for for me to lead, have everybody ready so we can make the most of the NFL being out here and get some kids over there and start a bit of a system. Because the, the love is there on the U.S. side. We just got to make the most of it here. And it's going to be... By no means any of that story is going to be easy. Creating all those things is not easy. It's cost a lot already. We're already traveling around and doing a bunch of stuff and working with some really good brands, some really good people. And we're just trying to increase that and increase our positive touch on the world. I'm not going to be here forever. I've already faced death plenty of times. You know, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. So I better make it real good. And I'm not here to just be famous and hang out and do nothing. I want to I want to help some people. I want to continue my story through through thousands of others hopefully. Yeah, you know, I just put my Super Bowl jersey up to be raffled off to raise money so other kids can can do it. You know, like it's uh, the metaphor of sacrificing a piece of my journey to help start the thousands of others it means more than having a Super Bowl jersey sit in my house. It's been sitting in my closet for who knows how long. You know what I mean? If I can sacrifice that, raise a couple hundred grand, I'll change a thousand kids' lives, you know? And that's much more powerful than having a piece of jersey in my house. Well, what's really powerful to me is the inspiration you just dropped right on there. So, uh, Jesse Williams, thanks very much. Really appreciate it. And by the way, best of luck, mate. Appreciate that. Such thanks a for having me. me. Absolutely.